Well, thank you very much. Thank you, Morad, for the introduction. Thank you to Quantify for inviting me to speak at this event, and it's nice to see you all here. In fact, as some of you saw as you came in, everyone and his dog is here. Um, thank you for those of you who laughed. Um, you didn't all see the dog, obviously, or you just don't like my jokes. Okay, probably the latter. Let's move on. Um, so what I was asked to talk about today is, um, uh, well, uh, the challenges in XVA pricing and valuation, um, and trying to be distinct about those two things. Um, it's gonna be quite a quick talk, uh, with hopefully a bit of time at the end for any questions you might have. Um, and so what I thought I'd say is just look at, um, obviously what, what um, we're gonna talk about here, regulation, quantification, which is clearly a big challenge, and then what I've called usage and overlaps. Um, if that's not clear, hopefully clearer when I get onto it. In other words, okay, so we can write formulas and, and do stuff like that, but, but sometimes the problem is even more fundamental, such as should this be an accounting adjustment? You know, how should we deduct this from here? Does this overlap with this and so on? So that's really what I want to cover in this relatively brief talk. So to start off, I think, um, the pricing and, and valuation and risk management of OTC derivatives um, has obviously been a very large field um, and has covered many, many different products. And if we go back in time, it, it generally doesn't involve anything like we're talking about today with things like XVA and central clearing and so on. These are subjects which a decade ago were maybe the least trendy and uninteresting things in general to work on to, to a large degree. Um, and obviously some of the things there were much more interesting and trendy to work on and important. And um, we thought indeed that we could price those things, albeit in relatively difficult ways sometimes. But then XVA happened, um, and obviously that has led to uh, the realization that um, we don't actually know a lot of things that we thought we did know, and going back to very simple things like you know, the Black and Scholes um, formula and the derivation underlying that and what the assumptions are uh, has been important. And obviously things as fundamental as that have been challenged within the derivatives world. So this is what it sort of looks like at a high level, of course. A derivative can be both in the money and out of the money when it moves in the money, which is what I'm showing initially there, we have a number of things that happen. Uh, first and foremost, of course, I have counterparty risk because if I'm uncollateralized, then a default would mean I would suffer losses. Now, it is possible that I might receive collateral and that would happen above the threshold, so this is very general. In, in reality, the threshold might be zero or infinity. But above a threshold, I'm going to receive collateral from that counterparty and the counterparty is going to decide, to some degree, what type of collateral they will post me. And also, I've got a funding cost, because to the extent they're not posting me the collateral, then the perceived wisdom is that I have somehow to fund the position, um, which I don't actually have any um, collateral, which would be a source of funding against. Um, so we've already covered sort of CVA, which is of course the first of these terms, and FVA, which is the funding bit, and what I call COLVA, uh, which is the collateral bit. But obviously the, the transaction can go against us, and to some extent there are sort of mirror image type situations here. And when it goes against us, we've got our own counterparty risk, because from an accounting point of view, certainly, if you default, then you somehow make a gain, and that's the sort of DVA thing, of course. And so at least from an accounting point of view, we would have to respect that within some sort of valuation and say, well, because we can default as well as everyone else, we have to price in that component. Obviously, that's been a contentious component. We've also got our own funding benefit, and, and they're really the same thing, which we'll come back to later. We call also, if we post collateral, choose what type of collateral to post, and so there is some sort of optionality we have there, and again, that's the collateral VA. And then right over the... The lifetime, just shown at the top here, I've just called it the lifetime cost of capital and initial margin. So what is the cost of holding capital against that transaction? Probably regulatory capital, because I think we, we used to be more concerned with economic, again, many years ago, but I think regulatory, for obvious reasons, is, is the top concern of banks now. 
uh, and also any initial margin we might have to post, which, which is a bit like capital. Um, now, obviously, that's fairly uncommon in history, but becomes more common in the future with the like of the central clearing mandate and so on. So I've got to work out what the cost is of posting the initial margin against that transaction. And then finally, I probably have to realize that I shouldn't be looking at this transaction in isolation. So first of all, of course, there are portfolio effects that may change the magnitude of certain contributions. But secondly, I might have to look at, I'm having to hedge this transaction. If this is a client transaction, how do I hedge it? And for example, do I have to clear those hedges at a central counterparty? And is that more costly than it used to be? And if it's more costly, can I charge the client for th that um, amount? So it's not always looking at, okay, this transaction. It's more looking at this portfolio, this portfolio, and its hedges, and so on. So that's really where the world of XVA has come from. Now, one thing I, I, I quite like to look at or, or suggest is that really what all these VA terms are about is a sort of proper upfront pricing and valuation of future costs and benefits potentially. So if we start with CVA, the traditional approach to CVA, which of course is, is not really market standard anymore, um, is that a trading desk or a sales division would just face losses or someone would face losses when a counterparty defaulted. Um, the current market practice is, of course, more there will be a CVA desk, there will be correct CVA pricing and valuation, and there will be central management, meaning to some extent that potential default will be hedged. Whether or not it is, of course, possible to hedge it is, is another matter. But there's certainly the intention to hedge those risks as much as is possible. And that's been driven by accounting standards, IFRS 13, and it's been driven by Basel III. So saying, we're not going to trade derivatives and every time someone defaults, have a bit of a shock and lose money. We're going to properly price it into transactions, value it, and hopefully not get as many surprises. FVA is a little bit the same. The traditional approach is we bear the costs of funding on a sort of overnight accrual basis. Or I've charged, the Treasury will charge my trading desk for funding on an overnight basis. And if things are quite expensive to fund, we might to some degree find that that's unexpected. No, so we need to price that in properly at inception. We need to create what we might call an FVA reserve. We need to put it in our financial statements. And again, we need to manage it at the same time. So that sort of FVA came on the back of really the practices f that happened for CVA. And of course now it's not my CVA desk, it's my XVA desk because they're probably doing more than one thing at once. And again, that's been driven by IFRS 13 to some degree um, and it's been driven, if you like, by best practice. Collateral VA is rather similar. Historical view, we post collateral. The job of the collateral management team is to make sure we receive it when we need it, and when we have to post it, we post it on time, and we don't make mistakes, and we follow up when people don't post to us, and that's all fairly sort of um, logistical and back office -y, if you like, whereas now the role is, okay, what's the value inherent in our collateral agreements, and how can we optimize that value as much as possible, post the right kind of collateral for us, substitute if it's possible, and get the pricing and valuation correct. So again, we don't have any nasty surprises with some losses in the future. Again, best practice. And then finally, KVA. It's quite a hot topic at the moment. Again, the traditional approach is a trading desk might get charged for their capital usage. The KVA approach would be more, no, we price it in properly up front and some sort of profit gets released over time to meet our required capital hurdles. Um, and so therefore, again, there are no surprises. We don't find there is a business that is using a lot of capital and is therefore not really profitable in a return on capital notion, and we decide one day we want to shut this business down. Uh, we would have known that more likely at inception of transactions rather than getting the nasty shot later on, and we would not have traded at those levels or, or whatever. So if you want to know about sort of what's going to happen with KVA over the coming years, you know, the obvious history lesson would be, well, it's sort of going to go the same way as CVA, FVA, and so on. Um, although, obviously, it's always, always very difficult to answer questions like that. Will banks start reporting KVA in their financial statements? Risk recently did a survey. I don't think the, the picture is completely clear, but, but certainly from the history lesson point of view, you would, you would say it's likely. So 
Um, regulation has obviously um, had a bit of a part to play in all of this. And one way I thought would be interesting to just go through that, um, just on one slide, is to say, well, suppose we did the following transaction sort of 10 years ago. 20-year interest rate swap collateralized um, to a CSA with cash and bonds. And, and now it's quite in the money because of rate movements. Now, I think it's probably fair to say in 2007, we wouldn't have considered much of an XVA component when we priced this swap, if any, because it was collateralized, uh, and so on and so on. Now, if you look at all the different things that you would have as a problem, if you like, the fact you've got to think about CVA, yes, it's collateralized, but auditors would not be happy with you ignoring CVA on collateralized transactions. Funding. Funding costs could arrive if, arise, for example, if you're uncollateralized to some degree, or if you struggle to re repo the collateral you would receive. Collateral. Counterparties utilizing their cheapest to deliver optionality to give you the collateral you probably least want. Capital. Did we price in enough capital on this transaction? Well, we probably didn't price in regulatory capital. We certainly didn't price in the CVA capital charge because it didn't exist in 2007. We may now have a margin period of risk of 20 days because of disputes and so on and so on. LCR, NSFR, okay, we need a liquidity buffer for a three-notch downgrade of any liquidity outflows. Now, when we had this CSA, we may well have had ratings triggers in there to say that if we were downgraded, we would post more, or if the counterparty was upgraded, they might post less. And at the time, that didn't really seem like a big deal. Whether or not we think we're going to be downgraded by three notches, we now have to hold a liquidity buffer. So if we were, for example, having to post initial margin on that downgrade, that is now costly. We might as well pretty much post the initial margin today, because we've got to hold it in high quality assets anyway. Leverage ratio coming in as well, an additional sort of capital constraint potentially. Uh, and finally, the clearing mandate and the initial margin, oh, sorry, the bilateral margining rules coming in, is that going to affect maybe the hedges of this transaction and make them more costly? So you can see that regulation and the change in market practice and accounting has just sort of piled on the sort of things I would worry about and, and the XVA components I would want to price into this transaction. And were we to want to innovate this now, we certainly be, wouldn't be doing it under the sort of same sort of pricing terms as we would have done at inception 10 years ago or whenever. So that's regulation. Then there is quantification. Um, so, I mean, very basically, that's what we do when we quantify XVA. We have some sort of profile which represents a cost of exposure or a cost of funding or whatever, cost of capital, and we integrate over it in some fashion to get our XVA, and that's the whole concept of I want to know it today properly rather than experiencing a loss, a, a, a surprise loss, if you like, in the future. But embedded in that, what are the sort of quantification problems? Well, um, there is a curve problem. How do I get the credit curve of my counterparty? Um, the single name CDS market is relatively liquid. It's probably not got any more liquid over the last few years, especially for the type of counterparties we might be looking at, like relatively small corporates who may be uncollateralized, therefore. Um, they definitely don't trade in the CDS market. Um, some of our counterparties that are secured may well do, but they would be of less, less note anyway. Um, the mapping methods that we have to use to come to estimate the spread of our counterparty t to drive our CVA formula, where you have to basically say, I don't really know where this credit trades in the market. All I know is some sort of categorization of it, such as it is a single A corporate in Europe. I have to come to an appropriate spread for that counterparty, and that spread will be volatile, and I'll be subject to that volatility, but it's almost sort of unreal volatility because it's not a real spread I can necessarily go out there and trade. That's all very difficult and, and fairly subjective and may, may be creating volatility you don't really think you should have. Um, the collateral side of things, you now need a sort of multi-curve framework with OAS uh, alongside LIBOR and tenor and cross-currency basis and so on all respected um, and possibly also government bond curves reflecting repo markets where you might be receiving or posting bonds rather than posting cash. And the cheapest deliver pricing is very challenging for worrying about things like substitution. Can I, can I freely substitute collateral? Um, and what's the inherent optionality 
in being able to do that. Um, on the funding, that's FVA or, or MVA, which is what I call initial margin. Um, well, what is my funding cost? Is it a short-term, a medium, a long-term funding cost? How do we really fund a derivative? We don't term fund it, probably, but then again, we don't sort of roll over very short-term funding either. So it's somewhere in the middle. How do we even define that? What about the credit quality of our counterparty? So I think my cost of funding is this. And now I'm going on trading with a AAA counterpart. Do I really charge them my cost of funding? Because if I would presumably trade with a lot of AAA counterparts, uh, my funding situation would improve. Um, it's not AAA counterparties who are meaning that I have uh, this funding cost, potentially. So I might believe somehow I should charge a high quality counterpart less, which seems to make sense. Indeed, the cost of funding should relate to the quality of the asset you're funding. But how, how, do, I, how do I bring that into play to have some sort of FVA that depends on the credit quality of my counterparty? Um, what's the cost of funding initial margins and default funds that I would give to a CCP, including the fact I might have to contribute more to the default fund in, in some scenario where there has been a, a default at the CCP. And finally, capital or KVA, what return on capital do I want? Um, but not so much that. I think that number is relatively stable. What about adjusting for tax and efficiency and other things to give me my sort of gross return on capital that I think if I make this much money, I can therefore release this and get the required return on capital over the lifetime? Um, in my experience, yeah, okay, maybe return on capital of 10%, but then how do I adjust for these other things that will take that number up? That becomes even more subjective. So first of all, you've got a curve problem. Lots of very subjective curves to drive your XVA calculation. Then you've got a sort of exposure modeling problem um, without getting too geeky. Um, what model do you choose? Clearly, a fairly uh, simple model tends to lead to relatively fast calculations, which are obviously needed. Um, more complex models would be better, especially for exotics, where exotics here is anything not really, really boring. Um, it's a multidimensional framework, so I might be mod modeling many, many different risk factors, interest rates, FX rates, and so on and so on, and I'm needing to deal with collateral as well within all of that. So there's really a, a very subtle balance. Um, computation time, there's a fairly big bottleneck here. In fact, there was a conference on FRTB recently on, on VAR, essentially, and people are complaining about speed a lot. And, and I tried to put across it in a nice way that you should, you should look at XVA a bit, because if you look at XVA a bit, you have no worries about speed in a VAR model or whatever you want to call it nowadays, because that really isn't a big challenge anymore. You know, this, is, this is an order of magnitude at least more difficult in terms of the amount of work you have to do and real-time calculations and all the Greeks and everything else. Um, that's led to techniques like AAD, um, GPUs being put forward as potential solutions. So it's very difficult now to, be, uh, to have a very traditional setup. You need something extra in the way of power there are other issues like the risk neutral versus real world debate. So I'd really like to have maybe some sort of calculation of exposure in the real world, which is more driving things like my PFE, my limits, my capital potentially. But then I need a pricing framework for things like CVA and so on relating to hedges. So do I, do I try and have these two frameworks? Do I just go have one framework that covers everything? Do I have two systems? Do I have one system that does two things? A, a lot of questions around that. I have a liquid markets with, with limited access to long-term volatilities. Very difficult to calibrate correlations, of course, and, it, and it's difficult to be conservative with a correlation um, because, of course, uh, you could be conservative by being plus one or you could be conservative by being minus one or even somewhere in the middle. Um, and then uh, overall, that I think you have a, a sort of 80-20 rule or even worse, which is it's probably relatively easy to do the, the first bit of my problem, which might be to be able to calculate XVA on interest rate swap. And that actually has dealt with quite a large number of products, or transactions, should I say. And then, of course, I'm worrying about how do you calculate XVA on a PRDC or something. And I've only got seven transactions, but um, you know, it's still a question I have to deal with. So there's a sort of 
uh, law of diminishing returns, you know, it gets harder and harder and harder and you're achieving less and less and less. And, you know, presumably at some point you give up and say, well, I've kind of probably done enough from a pragmatic point of view. Sorry, I didn't really mean you give up. You never give up, obviously. Um, um, now, my final point, uh, I called uses, usage and overlap. So, okay, so we can compute XVA with, um, with all our GPUs or whatever we're using. We can come up with all our curves. We know what all the regulatory requirements are, so we've done all that. We've got maybe one, at least one sort of general problem left, which is when is an XVA real and when is it not? There have been a few arguments, notably around FVA, to the extent that maybe you shouldn't be including this in your price. Maybe you shouldn't be including this as an accounting adjustment. So notably, of course, Helen White, very respected academics, said FVA, initially said FVA shouldn't be included in pricing evaluation. Um, and there was quite a, uh, I think, quite a heated debate in the market. Um, sort of, you're, either, you're on one side or the other, and you know, it's a sort of 50-50 split, and, and it's, it's, it's a big fight. Um, totem results, which is more sort of market practice, of course, um, showed very clearly that FVA is included in prices, and um, it's broadly speaking symmetric. In other words, there's a funding cost and a funding benefit, broadly speaking. Um, there are also arguments, okay, FVA should be there, but it shouldn't be symmetric. So Albanese and uh, Ibra oh, I can't pronounce it, sorry. Um, Albanese and et al. Um, say posting collateral is a funding cost, but receiving collateral is not a funding benefit because it's inherently unstable. So you shouldn't think that the collateral you receive against the derivatives book can be some sort of funding benefit. So that's a sort of another point, not quite the Hull and White point, but a slightly different point. Um, now, a heart of some of this is the fact that FVA is a wealth transfer from your shareholders to bondholders because your shareholders have to come up with the funding and then your bondholders get paid more in the event of a default. So it's some sort of internal wealth transfer, as first noted by, I think, by Burgard and Kaya. Um, so the impact on your overall va balance sheet is actually not there, which sort of gets you back to the Hull and White argument. FBA isn't really there across the whole balance sheet. Yes, but when we show our financial reports, shouldn't we be more looking at our shareholders, in which case it should be there, because it's a real cost to our shareholders, if not our bondholders. Again, Albanese et al. suggest that you take FVA as a CT1 adjustment rather than a, a, an accounting-related adjustment, um, partly due to some of those arguments there. But you can see from that, what's absolutely clear is we don't quite know what FVA is and whether or not we can calculate the formula. It's a bit more fundamental. It's like, well, what do we actually do with it when we have calculated the formula? And these things will clearly go on. Um, now, the, finally, the overlaps are important. So there's sort of the overlaps, the, the first easy one, DVA and FBA. So our, my DVA and my funding benefit, everyone sort of agrees now, they're more or less the same thing. So you can have one or the other, although it's not really clear completely which one you should have. And of course, they're not completely identical. So it's not as simple as saying you can have one or the other. Um, should I use my own CDS curve to define a DVA? That would be more my accounting view. Or should I use my own cost of funding to, to derive some sort of funding benefit? That's one problem. If you look at um, the Solemn Financial Survey we did earlier this year, you'll see terms flying around like incremental FBA, which is sort of in line with this. So I've got the DVA and I want to put in an FBA, so I need an incremental FBA, and, and that's my little fudge. CVA and FCA, that, again, we're back to the Hull and White argument. If I've already priced in the credit risk, wouldn't that contribute to my own funding costs? And so I thought I can't price it in again. So arguably there is a sort of overlap between the funding cost I charge and, and the credit risk I've already priced in through CVA. And I would refer to that therefore as being what you need to charge is the funding liquidity risk premium. Not that you know what that is, but clearly not your entire cost of funding. And, and for example, Citigroup in their annual report on FBA mentioned specifically the funding liquidity risk premium. Uh, and this may be a sort of way to sort of resolve the Hull and White type debate without, of course, ne anyone necessarily losing. And indeed, Hull and White themselves in more recent papers say something to the effect of um, FVA is uh, for the bit of your funding which is not related to your own credit risk. They almost certainly put it more elegantly than that, but that's the crux of what they say.
Um, CVA and KVA were well, the salesperson in a bank's argument, which is always, you charge me for the cost of hedging counterparty risk, then you charge me for the capital because you can't hedge it. So you're sort of charging me twice. So there's a sort of overlap between CVA and KVA, which is why some banks tend to charge the max of this and this when they're pricing an XVA, which I, I personally don't think is the right way to do it. The right way to do it is, of course, to understand that if I hedge my CVA, I will get some regulatory capital relief and to price that in. But of course, the question is how much regulatory capital relief will we get, knowing that our hedges are imperfect. We'll probably be hedging with indices and so on, not single names. So we're never going to be anywhere near 100% clearly. So how much capital relief will our CVA desk get on this transaction? Finally, FVA and KVA, well, if we're looking at sort of capital, can we use capital as a source of funding? So when we sort of calculate KVA, should we reduce the FVA because that capital is inherently a source of funding? How do we put all the bits of the jigsaw together? And obviously, all these are questions. I'm not giving you answers so much as telling you what the questions are. So in order to finish on time, uh, and so we might have a couple of questions at the end, my summary, um, we, we've got many challenges in XVA in the years to come, for example, modeling, computational aspects, incorporation of regulatory rules, including future rules that we don't even know about yet, or some that we do know about. For example, in July, the Basel Committee published a fairly significant first consultative document on what would be a sort of fundamental review of the trading book for CVA, which would imply a completely new set of capital charges to replace the existing ones at some point. How do I incorporate that into my pricing today? It's very hard to know. I certainly can think about how I might incorporate it into my business decisions, but not necessarily how I price a transaction today. Curve building and the accounting treatment, of course. Um, and of course, once we've done all that, we can properly claim that we can actually, as I said at the beginning, price and value OTC derivatives again, which we sort of thought we could do, and then unfortunately, thanks to XVA, we realized we very much couldn't do. So thank you very much for your attention. I was going to plug my book at this point, but I don't need to because others have plugged it for me, so I would like to plug yeah, Rowan doing the marathon in New York, which at his age is, is very impressive. So instead of buying my book, I would urge you to donate to Rowan's cause. Thank you very much. Mr. Gregory, thanks very much. Just, um, what, what did I say? Uh, all the salient points in one handy little uh, deck of slides. Fantastic. Thanks very much indeed. Do we have, I, ha I have a fair few, which we wouldn't have time for, but uh, as befits the chair, open the floor first. Any questions for Mr. Gregory? John, many thanks. I've got a question. Can you elaborate on the uh, correlation bit and the quantification? You mentioned there's the correlations cannot be as conservative. That's one effect. And the other one is around the copulas. You mentioned Gaussian. So if you have the choice, which one would you go for? <laughs> Did I really mention a Gaussian copula? Well, you mentioned Gaussian up bit. there. Did I? Oh, oh, it's on the slide. OK, so I typed it. OK, sorry. <laughs> um, yes, I mean, there are, there are several levels of the problem, I think. First of all, one, when we start talking about correlation, as we normally define correlation in uh, financial mathematics, then straight away we may be talking about the wrong thing because, of course, correlation, as we talk about it, linear correlation is only one form of dependency. So first of all, I hope that my notion of correlation that I'm using to quantify here is the right notion to be applying within my model. If that is the case, then depending on my uh, portfolio, a high or a low correlation for that particular risk factor may be beneficial or not. So I ca unlike volatility, I can't say, well, if I take stressed correlations, they're bound to be conservative. Uh, they're probably more likely to be close to one or minus one, so they're probably more likely to be conservative, but, but I can't be sure. Um, and therefore, from the point, and then to answer your question, therefore, on, you know, so what copula do I use? Do I use a Gaussian copula? I think it really depends on what you're trying to deal with. So I think if I was trying to deal with counterparty risk evaluation or market risk modeling under FRTB, I think I'd be happy to say, right, Gaussian copula, um, as we use. And my problem is the correlations and the stability of those correlations across time. And, and if I've got correlations that are clearly very unstable, that's a problem. But obviously, regulatory rules allow me to have that notion of correlation. 
if I'm dealing with something like wrong-way risk on a sovereign FX transaction, I think I probably need to go right back to the start and say, well, I, I, maybe I don't even want to think about correlation here. I want to think about how the FX rate is related to the, to the default and the fact that there is more, more of a causality or something inherent in there. So I think it's knowing when to sort of wheel out your Gaussian copula and, and worry about what the correlation number is and, and when to uh, uh, tell it to go away. Thank you. Now, the other question I have is around <laughs> LEG76. Does it still have a role in all the, the sum of models? Yeah, absolutely. Why not? So is that then still the most important model or less so? Well, you know, it, it, ideally, I wouldn't have to rely on that. And, and ideally, I wouldn't be simulating my interest rate with a Holland White model and then valuing something with a Black 76 model and worrying about, hold on a minute, I've simulated negative interest rates and the black model doesn't allow it negative interest rates, so it can't actually price something when rates are negative. But rates probably should possibly go negative now, even not very much, but I, I'm happy with the model that goes negative. And I should probably replace all that problem by having a much better model and so on, but I have to be pragmatic. And if I, uh, the implication of the July paper from the Basel Committee would be that to have the advanced approval, um, you would need to be able to generate your CVA Greeks very in a very timely fashion. Now, it's fine for FRTB in general because, of course, saying you need to comp compute Greeks for a derivatives book, you know, if you can't compute Greeks for a derivatives book, why have you got a derivatives book? Um, but compute CVA Greeks for a derivatives book, you know, that's a much bigger challenge. There are by far more, uh, and you're probably going to have a lot more issues with things like PNL Explain. So if that's my problem, I'm, I'm probably not as worried about the fact I'm using a Black 76 model as, <laughs> as the underlying valuation engine. Thank you. Righto. Um, just time for one very quick one, actually, if we may. I make it a minute on my mind watch. Anyone? No? Okay. Uh, just a uh, uh, very interesting run-through of uh, Mr. Hull's, sorry, Professor Hull's position, that the chap who, um, whose book I had on the desk with me at Ambrose uh, nearly 20 years ago, so I yield to no one in my admiration and respect for the man. But we were on opposite sides. We shared a panel at a risk conference, I think, 2012, 2013, giving each view, and he has since recanted some of it. And the, the expression is um, where the FBA that he, I mean, I've always thought it, it's valid, um, the tenor, very good question you ask. It's not overnight, but it's not the full term either, but it ain't overnight, especially when, you, when your bank has just written a 70-year inflation index derivative. I'm looking at a particular direction here. Um, but he, he didn't recant, and in fact, what he did also admit to was incorporating the term liquidity premium. So that part of your funding cost that isn't your own credit risk, mm -hmm. but is a term liquidity premium. And the TLP is specific to each bank. It isn't the uniform. So uh, he did kind of come back on that. Otherwise, thank you again. I really appreciate that, and I'm sure we all did. So a big round of applause again. Thank you. Thank you very much.